In 1953, Lockheed began work on one of the most ambitious fighter aircraft of the Cold War. It had a single goal, to be the fastest combat aircraft in the world. Developed under Clarence Kelly Johnson at Lockheed's Skunk Works Division, the F-104 Starfighter was unlike anything before it. It was small, narrow, and built around a single General Electric J-79 engine. Every surface was designed for speed. Thin wings, sharp edges, minimal drag. The Starfire would go on to set records for altitude and velocity, reaching over twice the speed of sound. But as the aircraft entered service across NATO, its legacy became complicated. In countries like West Germany, hundreds of accidents followed. The same design that broke records also exposed the limits of pilot training, weather conditions, and doctrine. In 1952, during the height of the Cold War, the United States Air Force issued a request for a new kind of fighter. The Korean War had exposed the limits of early jet designs, like the F-86 Sabre and F-84 Thunderjet, which struggled to match the speed and altitude performance of Soviet MiG-15s. The Air Force wanted something radically faster, an interceptor that could climb quickly, reach Mach 2, and strike incoming bombers before they reached U.S. airspace. Lockheed's Advanced Development Projects Division, known as Skunk Works, took the challenge. Under the leadership of Clarence Kelly Johnson, design work began almost immediately at the company's Burbank facility. By mid-1953, Johnson's team had produced a prototype unlike anything else in the sky. The XF-104 featured an extremely slender fuselage, razor-thin trapezoidal wings, and an enormous vertical stabilizer. It was so small and densely packed that the airframe barely had room for fuel or avionics. Johnson described it as a missile with a man in it. To achieve the required thrust, Lockheed selected General Electric's new J-79 engine, still under development and unproven at the time. It promised afterburning thrust of over 15,000 pounds, allowing the aircraft to reach Mach 2. Early structural tests were carried out at Lockheed's Palmdale plant, where engineers validated the thin wing's ability to withstand high loads at supersonic speeds. The first prototype, tail number 537786, was completed in early 1954 and delivered to Edwards Air Force Base for testing. Flight testing began that March, led by Lockheed test pilot Tony LeVere, with USAF involvement under Air Research and Development Command. The aircraft met its performance goals quickly, surpassing Mach 1 on its second flight and later reaching over Mach 2 in sustained flight. But the design's compromises were obvious. The tiny wing area resulted in extremely high landing speeds, exceeding 190 knots in some tests, and left little margin for error during approach. The downward-firing ejection seat, intended to keep pilots clear of the tailplane during high-speed bailouts, posed a serious hazard at low altitude. Still, the Air Force saw potential in the design's sheer speed, in November 1955, Lockheed received a production order for the F-104A. By 1958, deliveries had begun to operational squadrons under Air Defense Command. Yet the aircraft's intended role as a point defense interceptor limited its usefulness from the start. With internal fuel capacity of just over 900 U.S. gallons, it could stay airborne for less than an hour without external tanks. Its short endurance made it ill-suited for the longer patrol missions the Air Force envisioned. Despite that, the F-104 was fast, high-climbing, and intimidating, a technological leap unmatched by other Western designs of the mid-1950s. Still, Lockheed and the Air Force soon discovered that chasing speed had a cost. The F-104A officially entered service in February 1958 with the 83rd Fighter Interceptor Squadron at Hamilton Air Force Base, California. It quickly earned a reputation among pilots as a rocket with a man in it, echoing Johnson's own description. Powered by the General Electric J-79 GE-3A engine, the aircraft achieved a maximum speed of Mach 2.2 and could climb at more than 60,000 feet per minute. Test pilots such as Chuck Yeager and Joe Walker praised its raw performance, describing it as like flying a dart. 
In May 1958, Major Howard Johnson set a new world altitude record of 91,243 feet in an F-104A, followed later that year by another record of 1,404 miles per hour, then the fastest speed ever recorded by a production aircraft. But the design that enabled such performance also made it treacherous. The Starfighter's stubby wings, measuring only 7 feet from root to tip, generated little lift at low speed. This made takeoffs and landings exceptionally difficult, especially on short runways. The high wing loading, over 700 pounds per square foot, meant even small pitch errors during approach could cause abrupt altitude loss. Ground handling required great care, and crosswind landings were notoriously hazardous. Flight instructors emphasized precise energy management, and many early mishaps stemmed from stall or overrun incidents during recovery or approach. The F-104's flight control system was simple, but direct. It lacked stability augmentation systems that later fighters would use to assist pilots. At high speed, the controls were stiff and sensitive. At low speed, they were barely effective. Still, its radar and fire control system, the AN ASG 14T1 allowed for the use of radar guided AMI 9 Sidewinder missiles, a significant advancement for the era. Its M61 Vulcan cannon, a six barrel Gatling gun capable of firing 6,000 rounds per minute, gave the Starfighter formidable short range firepower. Maintenance crews, however, struggled with the compact layout of systems within the fuselage, which increased turnaround time and inspection requirements. Despite these challenges, the F-104's potential caught the attention of several NATO members. Germany, Belgium, Italy, and the Netherlands sought to replace their aging first-generation jets with a modern supersonic interceptor. The United States saw an opportunity to strengthen NATO's air defenses, and Lockheed saw a major export market. Between 1959 and 1960, negotiations began that would eventually turn the F-104 into one of the most widely exported fighters in history. Germany alone would order over 900 aircraft under license production through Messerschmitt Bolko Blom. By the early 1960s, the F-104 had broken records, established new benchmarks in climb and speed, and entered service across the Western Alliance. But its narrow focus on high-speed interception meant that in practice, it was often used for missions it was never designed to perform, low-level strike, reconnaissance, and nuclear delivery. During the 1960s and 1970s, a pattern of accidents surfaced across units flying the type under demanding peacetime training regimes. The aircraft's high landing and approach speeds, combined with frequent low-level flight profiles and instrument training conducted in marginal weather, produced a run of lethal incidents. Flight instructors and squadron commanders repeatedly pointed to gaps in conversion training, the mismatch between the jet's original interceptor role and the low-level strike and trainer missions it was being asked to perform, and difficulties in maintenance and life cycle logistics as critical causal factors. German newspapers and parliamentary committees pressed the Luftwaffe and the Ministry of Defense for answers. Families and unions demanded accountability. Operational changes followed, revised training syllabi, stricter weather minimums, and modifications to some flight regimes, but the public outcry left a deep imprint on policy and procurement debates. When investigative reporting and parliamentary inquiries in the 1970s uncovered payments made to intermediaries and officials tied to major export contracts, the political fallout was international. In 1976, the revelations reached a crescendo with prosecutions and resignations in several countries. Japan's political class was rocked when evidence implicated high-level figures producing arrests and long trials. Lockheed itself faced criminal investigations, civil suits, and a major reputational hit that forced corporate changes in export practice and compliance. Still, export customers who had invested in local production lines and training infrastructures found it difficult to switch suddenly to another platform. As a result, many air forces kept operating the jet through the 1970s and 1980s while investigating replacements and pursuing industrial remedies. Among experienced test pilots in a cohort of frontline aviators, the aircraft acquired a contrasting reputation. To pilots who had mastered its exacting handling, it offered unmatched speed crisp control response at high Mach numbers, and a straightforward cockpit that rewarded precise technique. Record attempts in civil demonstrations showed what the airframe could do when flown in its performance envelope. Pilots such as Daryl Greenemeyer and a number of civilian racers modified examples to set climb and speed marks, underscoring the platform's raw capability. 
In operational squadrons, specialists emphasized that the jet demanded disciplined procedures, strict energy management on approach, conservative crosswind limits, and intensive simulator and dual control transition training. Where those standards were met, mishaps rates fell. Where they weren't, losses followed. By the late 20th century, the jet had been phased out of frontline service across NATO as newer multi-role fighters with greater safety margins and lower operating costs entered service. Yet the design did not vanish. A small number of airframes were retained for conversion, test programs, and civilian use. Private companies acquired and refurbished examples for contractor test work, research flights, and heritage displays. A handful remain airworthy with experienced civilian teams that fly them at air shows and for specialized projects. Museums in Europe and North America preserve other examples in static condition. 